Major funding for these broadcasts has been provided by grants from New York Community Bank, Amtrust Title Insurance Company, Perfect Building Maintenance, m and Bank, Customers Bank, Marks Paneth LLP, Aerial Property Advisors, Sterling National Bank, Capital One Bank, Collins Building Services, Meridian Capital Group. Additional support has been provided by grants from AVR Realty Company, Amarant Bank, Bank of America Merrill Lynch, B6 Real Estate Advisors, Briarwood Organization, Chase Commercial Term Lending, Chase Commercial Mortgage, Citizens Bank, CPEX Real Estate Services, Douglaston Development Levine Builders, Flushing Bank, Friedman LLP, Handler Properties LLC Handler Real Estate, Hodges Ward Elliott INC, Investors Bank, James D. Kuhn Real Estate Center at Syracuse University, Kilroy Architectural Windows, New York's Window Company, Matone Group, New Banks, Newmark Knight Frank, Optimum Window Manufacturing Corp., People's United Bank, Rockefeller Group, Rosewood Realty Services, SJP Properties, Stonehenge NYC, TD Bank, Terra CRG, the Marengo Family Foundation, and these friends. February 14th, 1929, Alan V. Rose is born in Brooklyn, New York. How many people can I, you say have been around for 90 years, <laughs> close to 75 years in the real estate business, starting out on a truck, being in his own business 65 years? I have my friend, the legendary chairman of the board, CEO, crooner, <laughs> singer, Alan V. Rose, thanks for being here. Well, Thank you a, for having so me. So tell me about your parents. Tell me about your father's side, and then we'll talk about mom. The line. My father was born in Poland, and one of those crazy stories with the Cossacks who were always coming and raiding the village, and he had a brother that lived in England. How he got from Poland to England, I got 15 different stories, but apparently the story is that he walked <laughs> from Poland <laughs> to England. While he was in England, he became part of the British Army, World War I. And after the war, came back to London, and there was a fish and chip store there. And uh, this old lady, everybody called her Bubba, said, where are you going after the war? And he said, I'm going to New York to work. He said, oh, I have the most beautiful daughter, granddaughter in the world. You meet her, you're going to fall in love. And she gave him the name and a picture and a whole thing. And I don't know the picture. And he came to New York, promptly forgot all about it, threw all that stuff away, and he went to work in a sweatshop. And in that same sweatshop was my mother. She grew up in London? She was born in Russia, but then she grew up in London. No, none of those stories from those were ever <laughs> so how reasonable. Did you, when did your father come over? My father? Must have come over right after World War One, and he then got a job in a garment. got a job. He was a tailor. He worked in a, with the treadle machines. Remember, the, the, there was no electric machines; right. they were all treadle machines. And these guys worked hours and hours and hours. And then he met this woman that he had met. He met my mother. He had no idea that she was the same person. That uh, he met her by accident in this shop. When did your parents get married? Any idea? I think they got married in 1925, 26, something like that. Okay. And my uncle, who you knew, Julie right. Schneider, went to London, and uh, he said, your granddaughter, Faye, just got married to a very, very nice guy, and here's a picture from the wedding. So she looked at it, she looked him right in the eye. Sure, he says, I sent him there. <laughs> so <laughs> one of those crazy, you know, old-time stories, and 
sure enough, we found out that that was true, that she sent, she sent my father there, and my father had forgotten all about it, but by fate, this all so happened. You were born on 1929, right. February 14th, in Brooklyn, New York, right. right? Now, where were your parents living at that time when you were first born? My grandfather had a house on 73rd Street between Bay Parkway and 21st Avenue. And everybody in the whole family lived in that house. What did Grandpa do that he had a house? I mean, that was wealth listen, at this listen, time. This is kind of amazing. He was a builder. He built on Steinway Street in Astoria, which was a story was just coming into its own then. He spoke no English. I can never understand how he built in Yiddish. And um, somehow they built all these nice buildings on Slime. Of course, he went broke, you know, in the, rec in the, in in the Great Depression and never survived that mentally or physically. And, uh, and then his sons also became builders, you know, Julie and there's a couple of other sons. So Julie was your uncle? Julie was my uncle. Okay. And Julie didn't go to work in the textiles. He went into the building business. Right. Let's talk about growing up in Brooklyn in the 30s, okay? Let's talk about some of the jobs that you had, including the, uh, the job at the uh, bookmaking shop. <laughs> there was an Italian restaurant on the second floor on Bay Parkway, but I never saw anybody go in or out. I was, I was a curious kid. I was about 14, 15. I walked upstairs, and there's a guy sitting there, and uh, I said, what do you have for lunch? He says, he says, here's 10 bucks, go have lunch someplace else. I said, what do you mean? Sure, sure enough, it was a front you know, for bookmakers. So how did you become a, a runner for the bookmaker? Well, I was always promoting myself, you know, and I, I said to the guy, I said, listen, do you need anybody to, to work here or something, you know, I had to make some money. And sure enough, he said, listen, it's illegal. I, I said, I don't want to know about the legal or the illegal, but he told me what you had to do, and what you had to do is collect bets from people and pay them if they won, and nothing terrible, you know? What about the, the pinball, the pin setter, when they didn't have automatic right. pin setters? Well, these the have pool rooms, right. as you well know, you Brooklyn right. guy. And next to each pool room, in some cases, had bowling alleys. But the bowling alleys had no automatic pin setting machines. So what happened when you wanted to play pool, the loser used to have to pay. But I was so sure I was going to win. And the other guy was also so sure I was going to win. Neither one of us had the money to pay the 25 cents a line or whatever it is. So the gangsters that owned the pool room put us behind the pins. And we were pin setters. Now you get some big guy throwing that ball down the alley, and the pins are spattering. I used to come home with bruises all over my head. Now what about the Saturday Evening Post? Well, the Saturday Evening Post hired young guys in every neighborhood to distribute the pay. The magazine comes. The magazine came out uh, once a week, and uh, they paid <clears throat> two cents a copy. So I rounded up about 10 kids, gave them each a penny a copy, and I kept the second penny. And for about a year or two, we made a lot of money delivering Saturday, for us, which was a lot of money. So where did you go to public. public school? I went to PS205 in Brooklyn. And then which, junior high school? Junior high, Seth Lowe Junior High School. And then you went to the famous Lafayette? Lafayette High School. Now, you said to me as a kid, you also worked at S. Klein on the square? S. Klein was a famous department store on 14th Street. And they paid us the enormous sum of 25 cents an hour, which you were very lucky to get that kind of a job right. in those it's days. Good job. So what, it was what a good you, job. So what did you do for S. Klein? Eh, stock boy used to load up the stuff and not, nothing really interesting, but I needed the 25 cents so an hour. So let's talk about Hyas. I mean, the Hebrew. AIDS Society on... It was on Flappish Avenue in Brooklyn. And um, right after World War II, they were reuniting people in Europe who were displaced by the war with their relatives in New York. Now, I was convinced, because the files were the sloppiest you've ever seen, that there's a lot of people out there with the wrong relatives. 
But these people, when they came in, they were like sad looking, unhappy, you didn't know what was going to happen to them. So what was your job? What? My job, I was working around the office doing regular, regular office things. And I saw a cute girl with all of these people over there. And I said, where are you from? They told me, from Romania. So I say, do you know this song? I, Romania, Romania, Romania. You remember this funny? Well, within 10 minutes, I had 100 refugees singing this song. And the, the head of the whole organization comes in and she says, oh my God, what a wonderful morale. <laughs> now, now, I was afraid of getting fired. She gave me a raise. But speaking of singing, right. okay, singing aided you to enter the Jewish Alps, otherwise known right. as the Catskills. Right. Tell me about that, because you did an album a number of years ago. And now the end is near And so I face the final curtain My friend, I'll say it clear I'll stay my case, of which I'm certain. I used to get go to an agency and get hired by not the high class hotels. These were all little hotels, and where the people try to eat more than they pay. This was one of those. That was the big activity. Right, a lot of, of bush, you know. <laughs> in the south. And you know, today they have hotels with indoor pools, outdoor pools. The feature of this hotel, the big sign in front said, "Well water." This was the big thing. So uh, me and another two kids, we used to play music. And we, I, I loved to sing. And we'd get hired as a band. So we used to go up to the hotel. And the hotel owner used to say to me, what do, what do you do? <laughs> so I said, I'm a singer. He says, you're a singer? Says, you, want you can sing all you want, he says. But if you want to get any money or eat anything, grab a tray. So I became a busboy singer, a waiter singer. This is interesting because later this, on... You did this when you were in uh, high school? Yeah, at 15, 16, and probably part of 17. Okay, so you graduate Lafayette what year? 45, between 45 and 46. Is that when your dad was sick? Yeah, my dad was sick a long time, and this was near the end, and right. uh, he couldn't work. And, you know, he sat down and told me that... Uh, I couldn't go to college. I was the only one in the family that could bring in enough money even to just pay the rent, the amazing rent of $40 a month. Right, you were we living on pay. where? On 21st Avenue and 68th Street. So you moved Brooklyn. out of Grandpa's house? Yeah, by that time we had moved out of Grandpa's house and we rented this apartment. And uh, it, those were crazy days. That was a depression. It was nuts. So you're 16 years of age. Right. What happens with Uncle Julie? Uh, with a truck. No, Uncle Julie had nothing to do with it. I was standing on the corner in Bay Parkway, and one of the guys working for him wanted to hire some kids to do laboring, you know. So we, we got on the truck. We moved, went out. We had an office in Limbrook in those days. He had an office in Limbrook in those days. And what were we doing? We were mixing cement. We were carrying door jams. We were doing everything that you do as a laborer. And I realized after a while that all these kids I know that went to college to study engineering and this, I knew more than them. They were trying to figure out what a door jam was. I was carrying one all day what long. What happens about the one day about the guy who needs a storefront? Right. So I used to drive the truck. I was the only one in the office. The guy, I get a call from a guy in Merrick. And he said, listen, uh, I'd like somebody to come over and give me a, a proposal to put in a storefront. I get back in the truck, I drive over to this guy's store. I, one thing I was good at is sketching. And I sketch him a beautiful little storefront and uh, give him a price. And I made a deal with him, $25,000. So I come back to the office. And the boss says to me. <laughs> boss, are you out of your mind? You're the truck driver. What do you, what, how are you quoting deals? I said, well, look, here's what it is. I show him the detailed estimate. This is what this costs. This is what this costs. We're going to make $10,000 on this job. From that point on, I was the estimator. <laughs> no longer the driver. No longer the truck driver. I was the estimator. Making a long story a little shorter, by three years I was running his whole business. Then I realized after a while that he wasn't going anywhere. So and what happens? Well, you've got to remember, 
what Long Island was like in those days. Right. Valley Stream was the end of the expressway, and they had all kinds of plans to move east. Baldwin was being settled. And uh, two million people in Brooklyn all wanted to live in Long Island. This was after the war. Everybody had a little money. You had the GI Bill. You had the VA. You had all kinds of great financing. The government was trying to get people out of the city and put them in Long Island. And I decided that I was going to be a home builder. And while I was working for the construction company guys, me and another guy built two houses for ourselves. One for my mother, which right, I built. Right, this was in Valley Stream, correct? Right, this was in Oceanside. Oceanside. Lenox Road in Oceanside. So you bought two lots. I bought, no. I, we each bought a lot. And I paid, well, I paid for the whole house $8,000. And it had plaster walls, white marble chip ceilings, every kind of thing you could. Was, was, a lot of the labor we got for nothing. I had friends and you know who right. were all was, working. Was Pop alive at this time? Or yeah, he was alive. Oh, he was very much alive at that time, and um, so we got a building loan of ten thousand dollars. Right, and and the cost I had two thousand dollars. I was in action. I had two thousand so dollars. You take the two thousand dollars, and what do you do then? Two thousand dollars. I bought one lot on the on Grand Avenue if you know where that is in Baldwin. And I took an option on 20 other lots and decided to build a model and see, see what we could do. How much were the houses? Three bedrooms, two and a half baths, $18,990. So $18,990. Right. How did you come up with the price of $18,000? Well, Was it from the S. Klein days? <laughs> Well, who do you think the, the home builders were? The, the home builders were failed garment guys. And everything was 19990, 18990, everything was a 990. And uh, it was psychological. I don't know if it did any good, but nobody, it didn't seem to bother so you anybody. You built 21 homes. I designed the most beautiful little house you have ever seen in your whole life. I was always good at that. This was my forte. And uh, we sold them all out in four weeks. And we built them all, and we made the grand sum of about, I don't know, 30000 them. 30000 $30,000. $30,000. money. And I was an action man. I was, so ready, you, what, I was ready to move. So what did you do with the, the 30000 bucks? I mean, we have a picture of you at that time. <laughs> good-looking guy, really good-looking guy. So uh, I looked around, and I bought a couple of little deals, one in Merrick with about 10, 20 plots. But in Massapequa... It was a huge piece of land, 133 acres, and it was on the Great South Bay, and it was beautiful. The only problem was it was, the professor. 12, it was 12 feet below grade. There was no gas. There was no water. There was no electric. Now, what do you do with $30,000? If somebody came to me today and said they wanted to start a project like that with $30,000, I told them they'd rather go, to, go right to Bellevue. But the town of Oyster Bay was taking bids on dredging a channel from uh, uh, the bridge. Oh, it's Merrick, I think. Merrick or what's the next one to it? Yeah. Right. Going all the way to Massapequa. So I found the guy with the dredge. And I had no money to give him. I gave him, I gave him a piece of the project. And, uh, and we were the low bidders. We were the low bidders. We didn't make any money on the dredging, but we filled in two million yards of sand on our property for nothing. So now we had it up to grade, and we were ready. So what about the Columbia professor? <clears throat> Nobody in the history of Long Island, or maybe elsewhere, had ever built on marshland. And this was marshland. And uh, I was trying to figure out how we could work this out that you could have bearing that the houses could sit there. Everybody was afraid that it would sink in the mud. And I found out that the leading expert on soils uh, bearing was this Professor Burmeister who was at Columbia University. And I went to see him. He was a really nice old guy, completely famous all over the world for working on waterfront properties. And he was the US government representative going from like Maine down to Argentina. But very curious. 
And I said to him, what are you doing this summer? He said, oh, we don't know, he's married. I said, I'll tell you what, I'm going to rent a little house for you right on the bay for the summer, and you and I are going to walk around every day until we figure out how to build on this marshland. Because, you know, how many acres of marshland there was in Long Island? Thousands and thousands of acres. The whole South Shore was all marshland. And sure enough, by the middle of August, we had figured this thing out and how you overload the marsh with the sand that came out of the thing, squeeze the water out of the marshland, and you had to let it sit there for about a year. And by that time, it was the bearing was So fantastic. how many houses did you build there? Well, we could have built 300 houses, but I had a theory that you don't build all the houses. You build some of the houses. We built about 200 houses. Every other builder in Long Island was fighting to build and sell. I don't know how I learned this so early in life. Every house. So what happens when you try to build a community of, say, 100 houses real quick, usually go broke because you can't sustain the time period. So we sold 200 houses. In those days, you didn't make a lot of money on the house. If you made, uh, you know, $2,000, it was a, a miracle. But the price of the land, you can picture it in those years, the price of the land was going up like this. So by the end of the job, you made a little bit of money on the houses, the appreciation and then you had the value of the land go crazy. Now, what, what you said to me many times is that when you built property, the property that didn't do well was the corner property. So you created shopping centers. Well, by that time, you know, we were following the LIE. It was going east. Every time there was a nice intersection on the LIE, we bought some land to build housing. But nobody wanted to live right on the highway. It was noisy. It was dangerous for kids. So we always had a piece of land, you know, that was empty. And we started the housing maybe 100, 200 feet, 500 feet. And after a while, all those people needed shopping centers. Now, here's an interesting thing, and it also, you know, sometimes you're lucky, right? You come into life. If I was born now, like a lot of other kids, are, there's really nothing to do. There's too many houses. There's too many shopping centers. too much of it. In those days, you needed everything. You needed hotels. You needed shopping centers. You needed schools. You needed ho hospitals. Anyway, to make a long story short, we laid out shopping centers on all the land that we had left over by the highway. And there were a few guys that were really looking to expand. There was Hill Supermarket, which Hilly, is... Hilly Cohen. Hilly Cohen, right. Right. The, and the, the New England boy. Right. And uh, Liggett Rexall was, was the drugstore. They were from California. Right. Then, then you met Ira Warbaum when he... Well, before Ira, place. we had Hills. When we stopped with Hills, we had Ira. You know, that and was after. We even had Bohack. And Bohack. We had Bohack in Queens. And uh, Manhattan Avenue, Cal has that for a memory? That was 100 years ago, I remember them. And uh, sure enough, you know, there were only six strip shopping centers in all of Long Island. By the time we were coming in, we already had the people there, you know, and it right. worked and, out and good. You, and your traditional stores, uh, names that people would forget, as you said, the Lincoln right. Rexall. Right. Then you had W.T. Grant. W.T. Grant, Woolworth. Woolworth. Had, right, they're all gone. You know, you had all these uh, right. names from the past. Right. But this is what was needed because the community needed Absolutely. the housing over there. No, you needed, you couldn't sell the houses after a while, you know. You told me, I think it was your first wife lived up in the Bronx? My first wife lived on Jerome Avenue in the Bronx. I had met her in Grossinger's. The night I met her, they were throwing me out of the hotel. <laughs> hey, that's singing, another whole were, story. Were you singing in Grossinger's? Of course I was singing in Grossinger's. Tell me the story. I want to hear Come on, tell me. So uh, we were a bunch of guys. We were all from Brooklyn. And on the weekends, we would go to Grossinger's. And Grossinger's. Grossing was, was great. They had Olympic athletes as the coaches and right, all these things. They had things. the basketball and basketball, the coaches and all this. They had a, a, a golf, uh, golf course right. and stuff. But you also had all these horny young guys coming in there to meet girls. And the girls were doing the same, the same thing. And, uh, but we drank a lot. You know, you know, 18, 19, 20 years old, you drink. And uh, one night, and we used to go like two to a room, 
One night I come, uh, I come back. My partner in the room is in the room having a good time with some girl. And uh, I knock on the door, no answer. I was a little drunk, and there was a fire axe there. I knocked the door down and uh, opened the door. With that, uh, Harry Grossinger comes running in with a security guy from the hotel. Look what he did. Throw him out. I said, look. And the head of the nightclub was a guy called Steve Crindler, who's a fabulous guy. And he says, Harry, these guys are our best drinkers. They drink three, four thousand dollars worth of whiskey. That was a million dollars in those days worth of whiskey. Three, four thousand. He says to the cop, fix the door. <laughs> that was one of the things. But we always had crazy things going. So, so what we're going to do in part two is we're going to talk about how you met the, the woman from the Bronx, because that was very fortuitous for you to then subsequently uh -huh. go to Westchester, where you right. did a lot of work. Okay, because right. you had already finished lo a good portion of Long Island. No, you come you, you came Long Island was not even finished. We no, were, no. But we were maybe up to Hicksville or something. Right. But then we're going to talk about the expressway right. and everything else. And then we're going to even get as far as today with the Appank. Oh, as great. We do, as we get to part two on the life of the legendary Alan <laughs> Rose, we'll do next week. Thank you. So I face the final curtain, my friend.